Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys. Welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show. Our goal here is to find the best thinkers, speakers, teachers anywhere in the world to add some value during this podcast so you can create a better practice and a better life. And today, we bring back a dear friend of ours, Dr. Newton Fall, who's one of the best in the world, and ask him the question, are composite resins for this day and age in digital dentistry? It is awesome. So please listen to this. I hope you guys enjoy it and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. I tell you guys all the time, I'm so grateful for this, but I get to do this cool thing of interviewing some of the best thinkers, best clinicians, best teachers in all of the world and ask them what they're up to and topics that are important to them. And today is no exception. I'm one of the best dentists in the world. His, doc, his name is Dr. Newton Fall, and he is actually taking a break in between you know, beach time with his family to join us. And today we're going to be talking about our composite resins for this day and age in digital dentistry. Newton, thanks for being on, brother. I appreciate you. Hey, Kirk. So good to be back here. Um, it's always a blast being here with you. And I think you do a fantastic job with the show, uh, educating dentists and spreading the word. So I'm just so honored. Thanks. Hey. Glad to be here. The pleasure is all mine. It's all mine. And so um, you're up to some very cool things. And uh, I'll just say this about you because you won't brag, but I'm going to say it. I've asked Bob Marges, and Bob, I'm going to make you listen to this podcast. Like, who are the, who's the top 10 in the world? And you're, uh, I won't tell you what number, but it was very, very high. And so we've had you uh, many times. You're going to see Newton's a great thinker. He's a great human being. And you're just a great, great educator. And so let's go into the, the why of this topic. This does come up a lot. Let's talk about the big 30,000-foot view before we actually get into the details. Why is this so important? Well, I think it's very important because um, as we are evolving in our profession, uh, it's um, without question that digital dentistry will become a major percentage of any practice, just any practice. If you take a, the new generation, especially, they are all doing digital dentistry. They're CAD camming inside out, um, you know, from milling, from uh, implant, implant um, design, everything. You know, they're, they're imprinting. And what's happening here, it, very much like artificial intelligence, it's taken away the thought process that we were taught to have as dentists when we first got admitted into the dental school to start with. And that was so dear to us because we had nothing but a brain and our fingers and our eyes and our heart to, you know, do the emotional part of it. But then all of a sudden, what we see today is everything has become a machine, you know, and we're not machines. It's been said in the past, quote unquote, right? So what's happening today is that I see a lot, especially in revenue driven societies. And I'm talking about the United States. I'm talking about other parts of the world where you got to make um, your buck, you know, at month's end to justify the procedures that you do. And if what you do cannot be done effectively and produce just enough revenue to justify you spending the time to do it, then it's, it's out. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not part of your system. It doesn't matter what your um, insurance system will say. It's, and then it, and all of a sudden it becomes ingrained in the young practitioners, and I'm, I'm mentioning the young practitioners more so than the 
older ones because I think the older ones are more open to the idea of of still uh, logging in with that that the the tools that we were taught through in you know in hindsight and then what's going to happen is that they're going to say oh yeah so I can't rely on digital technology to assist me to be effective predictable and expedient in my procedures and make the revenue that I aim for so and you know it, it's, it's it's like very slowly um, desensitizing this generation towards not wanting to go back and learn the artistry involved with composite resins and then that's what we're talking about here because yeah. composite resins composite resins the way that we're going to talk here and the way that i want to present it to you will require a lot of fundamental concepts that include art and science in order for one to be productive artistic and ethical so bottom line is i think the eth eth the ethical aspect aspect of it needs to be brought in and thoroughly discussed yeah totally i love what you're saying and i think what you're saying is in a very very important point you know we come with sometimes these notions that you know, composite resins, you can't make any money. Like, you got to be spinning down teeth in order to make money. And that is not true. I mean, you'll appreciate this. I appreciate my teeth. Now, I'm gonna, I don't think I've ever shared. I don't have a single crown in my mouth. I don't want one. I drove all the way to Des Moines, Iowa to have him. To make, I'm like, hey, I broke a tooth. And I will do, I'll do a crown if we need to. But can I have the mask? He's like, well, you don't need to do a crown. And it was amazing and how, I, I mean, I'm telling my own personal journey here, but it was amazing to watch an artist work and with the advancements in all of these materials, it is amazing what he can do. And he actually showed me a full mouth reconstruction. I'm talking about Bob Marges that he was yep. doing in resin. And I'm like, Man. that's crazy. And he's like, you don't pay for tooth. You know, he said this, and I've shared this many times, we should have a tooth preservation fee, <laughs> maybe in some cases, you know? And I've so, heard him say that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so I want you to speak to that. It can be additive. You can actually reverse some of these things. Like there's, let's talk about, let's walk into this. So if I'm a young dentist, listen to this. Newton, where do I start? Like walk me through this. How do, how do I think better about this? Yeah. I think what's the best way for you to impress somebody about being healthy from a young age is telling they're going to die if they don't do it. So if you start with the wheel of death that we all know about, you know, the wheel of death that will say, well, you have a small caries and then you drill. And then from that drilling, it becomes an onlay that only turns into a crown. That crown leads to, you know, endo and then endo, it fractures and then it's an implant and then it's gone. So that's the wheel of death. It's telling the young generation, listen, if you're not careful with prevention, let's go back to prevention. And prevention is right, it's everything, right? So mm -hmm. let's not talk about augmentation with composite resins, preservation when, when you're adding. I mean, just let's talk prevention. If you start with prevention, uh, and we, we all know this, and whoever who's here who's uh, listening to us, if you have had a patient totally caries free with not a single caries, not a single restoration in their mouth, and you open that, it may be in proper occlusion or malocclusion, it doesn't matter. You're talking about virgin, untouched teeth. And it, how much better can you get? You can't get better than that. So when you evolve from that stage of prevention into the preservation stage where you say, okay, now, we have a pathology. A broken tooth is pathology. That's one thing. And then what you can do is, instead of doing a crown like Bob Marges didn't do for you, rightfully so, you can just add to it. And the science is there. Papers are there. The research is there to support that you are actually making that remnant stronger than if you were to prep a crown. 
for several reasons, because you're weakening by taking away sound dental structure. On the other hand, you have the augmentation part of it, which is adding to watch what is actually good. And then you're talking about cosmetic issues. You're talking about closing diastomas. You're talking about uh, class fours. You're talking about uh, smile design adjustment, re-anatomizing, if you will, the smile by just adding to it. Remember, uh, sometime in the past, and I'd say about 20 years back, Porcelain laminate veneers were really up here. People were drilling for porcelain veneers like crazy. And they were patting themselves on the back saying, my gosh, I'm really being conservative here. And they were claiming to be conservative because they were not prepping crowns, but they were prepping porcelain laminate veneers and they were taking away sound enamel and they were weakening the tooth structure and they were actually doing something that is called iatrogenic. That is iatrogenic. And actually dentists should be <laughs> filed a suit against if they did it. In some instances today, I wanna be controversial here because I've seen horrific cases, horrific. I mean, just, just horrendous uh, in, in cases in young teenagers that walked into a practice requesting that they would receive a treatment like that, you know, being laminate veneer, full mouth, and the dentist didn't have a way of saying no, and they did it without needing to. And that's, that's liable. Yeah. That's liable. Okay, so let's go back to the composite thing. So there are so many ways you can just add. Um, and I'm, give, I'm gonna give you a, a very good example here. My, my hygienist, who's also my dental assistant, who's been with us for 20 years, she has a gorgeous teenage daughter in her 18, 18, yeah, she's 18, and um, Giovanna is her name, and she, she had a little bit of an open bite and a little bit of a diastema between laterals and centrals and a, like an inverted smile, and she, but it, a little bit, a little bit of a malocclusion. It she did not want any ortho, but she she would want something uh, to improve on the way she felt about her teeth. In other words, she wanted to be more confident and all that. Blah blah blah. Right, and uh, and it was she was the daughter of someone who's been with me for twenty years, and uh, she was very shy. She wouldn't smile. The stories that we all hear. We all hear these stories day in and day out. Oh, patient comes in, they wouldn't smile, so we did this and they came out smile. We changed their life. We don't change patients' lives. We change their smile and it has an impact on people's life. But that's another story. That's also controversial. So but what, what, what we did for her without, and, and this is a fantastic uh, case because I would just add it. Sometimes one single shade, sometimes an enamel and a dentin shade, uh, sometimes direct, um, and on, on other teeth, I did direct and direct, which is the theme of my book. So we did from bicuspid to bicuspid without touching a burr to her teeth. And we completely, completely, fully changed her smile. Fully changed her smile. And sure, sure enough, she started smiling. She started feeling better about herself and blah, blah, blah. And then the same story. So what I'm saying here is, if what what technology would be available today, Kirk, in the digital realm, I want to say, what technology do we have today that would have the same impact without preparing her teeth and getting the same quality of margins, of anatomy, of contacts? And I'm talking about really refined artwork, technically speaking. Yeah, you can take composite blocks and you can mill them. And you know, you know Pascal Magni does beautiful work with that. A lot of people does, you know, you have the injectables that they can do, but I tell you, direct approaches and the direct and direct approach that I love so much that I've been doing for 30 years, they are unmatched for solving these situations Ceramic doesn't do it. 
that would be unethical. Anything that would be digital, it would be more costly to the patient because it would be more time consuming. It would require a lot of, uh, you know, material that you would be using for it, the time of milling uh, or making an, uh, uh, of imprinting a model, what have you. So this is so much easier provided the operator has the knowledge, the skills, and the art after learning how to do this effectively in an expedient, a fast, uh, a rapid way. Yeah, I love what you're saying too. And I think the cool, the cool thing about this podcast is your job as a clinician, if you're listening, is philosophically you just have to decide where you're going to go. And there's a lot of people and methodologies that can help you. And I love what you're saying, Newton. And um, I'll speak as a patient. I'm so picky. I mean, I, 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 I almost worry about any dentist working on me, period, because I, I, I get to see so much great stuff. Now, I'll, I'll do what Bob's face looked like. And, I, and again, I like picking on Bob because I got to see it firsthand. But when he was doing composites on me, this is how he was looking at it. <laughs> and if you're watching the podcast, he was twisting his head. Then he'd go back. Then he would ask his assistant and he'd go, ah, I don't, I don't love that. Hold on one sec. So like you talk about art, you could see an artist's brain engage in that. And then he pulls the mirror up and I'm like, I don't know mm, the length of this one. Can you, so, so I think your point is so spot on. I'm picky. And the thing that we know in dentistry is the higher the fee, the higher the expectations. To assume we're going to be able to nail a patient's expectations every time, that's a hard thing. And so I it think is. with this, with added, I mean, he was able to change directions and smooth a piece out and lengthen a piece just while I was in the chair, you know? So it's kind of cool, don't you think, that we have, we have the ability to do this? And again, you can charge full fee for this. Let me add one more thing, Newton. I want you to come in. My previous dentist, Craig Harry, I'll shout out to you. He's in the later stage of his career, but he's told me this. He's like, Kirk, I, I, I don't want to do a crown ever again if I don't have to. Like I do composites all the time and I charge, I'll tell you, he charges $1,200 an hour. There's no lab fee. I take my time. I do it. It's so much fun working on people that want this work. I don't feel like it's, we're bound by anything. I can reverse things. I can change things. And it's just easy. Now, I want you to comment on that. Is that, are we on track or off track with that? We are on track. I mean, I, I love what you say because this is totally my philosophy. And, um, and I want to rewind the tape here, if I may, to Ron Jackson, my good friend, Ron Jackson. And he taught me so much about charging. I met Ron in the early 1990s, it must have been like 91, I heard him at the AACD, and uh, he practiced, practiced in Middleburg, Virginia, you know, for crying out loud, which is a, a small little town in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's a rich area, but you know, like 1,200 people, right? And he made his living out of doing composites. Yeah, he did crowns on and off, but he said, and I charge a lot, there, and I do fee-for-service. And yeah, we said, well, what about patients who have insurance? So what I say is patients don't know what you're providing them. You have to educate them on what kind of service they deserve to have. If you think that not prepping a tooth and just adding a little bit of composite will do the job instead of prepping a crown and charging more because the insurance will pay more. So that you have to convince your patient and educate them as to the benefits of that tiny little bit of composite being as much as worth as that amount of money that they would spend to have their teeth cut down. And they don't know, but you are the one who have to tell them. And then he has that famous quote that I often use is, if you don't charge what you're worth, you end up being worth what you charge. Wow. And then I add to that, but in order for you to be worth what you charge, you need to earn it. You need to earn through the process of educating yourself to get there. So. And, and then and the, the I, I like what you said, you know, the the, the peer who charges twelve hundred dollars an hour, I think that's pretty fair. And in terms of fee, I'm, I'm totally fee for service. And I'd say that 85 plus percent of all of my restorative procedures and I am a restorative dentist. I do more than composites. I do crowns. I do implant supported. I don't do the surgeries, but it, it's composite. And I've made a living out of that, out of that. And one of the first things that I realized when I first published my article in 1995, 
uh, talking about the biomimetic principles of how to correlate the histomorphological aspects of dentin and enamel uh, of a natural tooth with um, current composites that we had at the time in terms of mechanical properties, optical properties, what have you, and how you could totally build a crown with composites and make it look like a natural tooth having the biomimetic principles behind it to withstand the rigors of function, having the, the aesthetics with more than satisfying, more than enough longevity. So when, when I started working with it, I said, my goodness, this is time consuming. This is time consuming. A class four that was originally meant to be about 15 to 20 minutes, it's going to take me about 45 minutes now if I'm going to go through the shade selection, pro shade selection process, uh, if I'm going to do a color mock-up to make sure that I'm doing, using, if I'm using five shades, you know, the enamels, the opalescents, the mamelons, what have you, I want to make sure that I'm spending the time and I'm charging enough so if the patient walks out of there, I don't get a phone call the next day saying, Doc, you know that tooth that you did? Nah, you know, you only spent 20 minutes, you know, I kind of appreciate that, but the shade doesn't match. Can you redo it for me? If a patient of mine has to come back in for a patch, for a remake, I'm, you know, I'm, the money, my profit is going down the drain. So I, I, I want to spend the time, the right amount of time in advance, treatment planning for something that I know will be right. So a class four, for instance, let's talk about fracture tooth. I spend about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. You know, and the more complex it, at, it, it is, the more time I'll spend. But I tell you, I get my money's worth. And in the ballpark, and usually these youngsters who uh, you know, are stepping in and say, well, well what, what, how am I going to charge for it? Because I've been told that I should charge like one-fifth of or one-sixth of what I charge for a crown. I said, man, you're not going to make a living out of that. First, you need to educate yourself as to the benefits of the procedures, learn how to do them, and then educate your patients to understand the philosophy and why it is, it is that you should charge a fee like, like Marge says for a preservation fee. And, yeah. and, and, and I mean, we sh this, is, this comes as a natural as part of any dentist, any dentist's philosophy if they want to be ethical. And then you say, okay, what, Dr. Fall, what is, what is a good starting point? So it's a good starting point once you know and you master the technique enough to say, well, uh, I'd say 90% of the time, or 85% of the time, I'll get this right. Charge that which you would for a laminate veneer for a crown minus the lap fee. And this is something that it's not my own thinking. It's something I learned from uh, Nietzsche, Nissan Bichacho, yeah. an Israeli. He said, Newton, this is a good way. I, I love your, this was back in nine, 1990s. I said, I love your composites. How much you're charging for them? He said, I sort of shared it with him. And he said, no, 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 no. Do this, do this. Man, and I did it. You know what? What happened? The good patients remained and they brought in better patients. The bad patient who didn't have the dental IQ to understand the benefits of that, they walked away. And they walked away with the bad patient that would, would, they would refer. So I would get referrals for, from good patients of good patients coming yeah. in. Yeah. And that's the name of the game. So that's it's so game. good. You know, and I think the important, there's so many important pieces here. You know, when people come to you, they have a problem. And they're paying for the outcome. They're not paying for how much tooth structure you remove or how, you know, and I think ultimately, Newton, what you're saying is absolutely true. Everybody's got to come up with their formula. And most of the people that I see in the mature stages, they just know what their time is worth. And they know if I'm going to work six hours today, this is about what I would charge. And you're charging for your expertise, you know, and your time and your knowledge and your skill. I want you to talk about this. Like one of the things that gets missed in composite resin conversations and you're the perfect person to ask. You're privy to so many insider conversations. You get to see materials before they hit the market. You get to hear conversations. Tell us about the advancement. Right now, as we're shooting this podcast, it is January of 2024. Where are we on the map in how fast these materials have, have come and where are we going? Like, where, what, what can you say about the materials themselves? They've come a long way, don't you think? Uh... I think I'll disappoint you here. Really? Uh, yeah. You know why? 
I love it. Go there. Just go there. They haven't? Composites have not changed all that much. Really? I love they it. They haven't. Their chemistry has not changed. Their, their polymer chemistry hasn't changed. Yeah. Let's break composites down into the inorganic and the organic phase. Let's take the organic phase, if we will. So we have the BIS GMA, BIS EMA, TEG DMA. You have the UDMA. You have all the... What, what are these? These are polymers that were built into composites to provide uh, cross-linking for strength, for durability, and then we have uh, some monomers that were incorporated to stabilize the uh, amount of shrinkage, to decrease the amount of shrinkage. Uh, some were incorporated to allow us to have better handling, less slumping, if you will, so you could sculpt your composite a little better. And uh, I tell you, for the past 20 years, nothing really major has changed in that realm. The, the industry is still endeavoring, striving to get to a level of close to 1% of shrinkage. So your, your composite will shrink less. So you don't have, you know, post-op sensitivity, stress, marginal gaps, uh, micro leakage, secondary carries, what have you, open margins, and they're aiming at having a higher level of cross-linking so that your composites will be stronger from a polymer-based standpoint, and they will last longer. Long story short, they will last longer from that standpoint. Now, let's go back to the second component, which is the inorganic phase. It's all glass. It's all glass. It's quartz, it's barium, and then you have zirconia because they want to make it stronger. They call it ceram composites, but it, it's, it's, it's all inorganic based. What have they done from the early composites way back in the 1960s? We're talking about Bowen here, right? <laughs> when he first developed the macro you know, composites. We had large particles for strength. They were like 40 microns big, very strong, but didn't polish. Then there came the microfills, 0.04 microns or 40 nanometers for polishability, but they were very weak. They started to break. Then there came the hybrids. They mixed the two. I have a strong material with a little bit better polish, but didn't suffice. Dull finishing, uh, it's kind of dull, I can't polish. So the industry started breaking down the larger particles to make tinier, like the conventional, the mini fill, the midi fill. Now we have the micro hybrids, then we have the nanotechnology, which is from five nanometers to 100 nanometers, with smaller, very, you know, like uh, fume silica and zirconia, they're in the sol gel um, uh, manufacturing process to make your composites polish well and now what they have is they have these tiny little spheres of composites clustered to make them stronger bottom line i don't want to get too technical here because this is boring bottom line is where we are today is we are with nanotechnology at a stage where they claim to have universal composites that can be used in the posterior area and, and in the anterior zone, just the same. That they will function in the posterior and the anterior just the same. This is true to some in some aspects, but it's not totally true. Why? Because if you have a strong material, it has to be a hybrid to withstand flexure, to withstand the rigors of chewing, mastication. But in order for it to be strong, the particles, the inorganic phase needs to be larger. And if they're larger, they don't polish. And if they don't polish, if you do veneers 
on the anteriors, they're going to be strong, dull looking veneers. Yeah, saliva will take care of it. All you do is to have your patient lick them up, and there comes the gloss. That's a, just a joke, bad joke. <laughs> but you need microfills or supra nano fillers or nano fillers for polish, and you need hybrids, micro hybrids, and nano hybrids for strength. But there, you can't just have the best of both worlds. So where we are today, where, where, where lies the biggest advancement, I think, is what we call the omnichromatic composites. So, and I don't want to really be commercial here, but I need to, I, I, I must bring up Tokoyama's uh, su superb job in um, devising something called Omnichroma, which is a composite made out of supra nanospheres, um, averaging 260 nanometers, and they could control the sole gel manufacturing process so well that these tiny little spheres emulate what we call photonic crystals that have no pigment in them, but they are able to reflect the light by breaking down natural light into the spectrum of the rainbow. So all the colors, and it picks up the surrounding color of the substrate. If you're doing a class one, it sort of picks up the color of that A3 tooth. If you're doing a bleached tooth and you do a 0 0.3, 0 0.5 millimeter thin veneer, that tooth pro uh, projects its color through that composite without lowering the value and you change the shape. Let's say you have a microdontia, a heteromorphic tooth, and you need to build out the facial to make teeth a little bulkier, a little more visible. What, what, what you're doing there is just adding a new shape without changing the shade. So this uh, new omnichromatic uh, material is a breakthrough. I'd say that's the very first one. And what's happening with the industry? A lot of manufacturers are trying to follow on the footsteps of Tokuyama, but they have a very proprietary technology, which is very hard to emulate. So I haven't, we still, we're doing studies uh, on that. We're doing spectrophotometry, color, uh, colorimetry. Uh, there's a current study that we're doing with uh, Rodrigo Maya, Un University of Michigan, and I'm part of the project. We're looking at these uh, capabilities to see if really the industry is all going the same direction, but I tell you it's not. So in terms of breakthrough for direct composites, that's the only thing that I can tell you. Other than that, forget, brother. I think we are in the past still. Yeah, I love it. I love it. You know, that's why I call on you. Just tell the truth. Just tell us the truth and uh, you'll hear it A here. lot of people may not like what I say, right? Hey, they don't have to like, don't worry, the network won't censor us. There's no network. We can say whatever we want. So it's kind of cool. Um I have so many questions for you, Newton, and I'm going to have you back again and again. And I want you to talk about your amazing course, but we'll do that in a second. Um, put this, put this in a bow, like wrap it up for us. Um, give us some final thoughts on, you know, our composite resins for this day and age and digital era. What, how can we sum this up? I think composites are more than ever for this day and age because we have the technology we have the technology, it's totally there. We have the artistry. There are over 70 types of composite restorative systems available commercially worldwide. So you can pick and choose. And adhesion is there. We have adhesives that will allow us to bond to teeth and have long lasting adhesive interfaces that will last a long, long time. And we have tutors, educators, and I'm talking not only about myself, we have true educators that can convey principles for anyone who wants to endeavor in that route and learn composite artistry so that they can be conscious about doing something that is ethical, non-invasive, 
aesthetic and money making. I mean, it, it's all there. It's all there. There is no excuse for anybody who will say, I don't do composites because I don't have the technology. I don't think I can make enough money with it. I don't think my patients will like it. I don't think they're going to last long enough. This is all a lie. It's all there. All it takes is for anyone to really dive deep into it and learn how to do it. They'll do it. They'll be able to do it. Yeah. And you'll be able to do it if you want to learn from a master. He is truly one of the best artists in the world. Now, Newton, I want you to talk about, you have a course coming up. It's called Mastering Interior Composites. And that's going to be on November 26th through the 29th. I want you to tell us, what am I going to learn in that course? How, what can I expect if I'm listening to this podcast? Well, this is an immersion type course. It's, it's a four day course here in Brazil. And, uh, We've had over 45 different countries represented thus far uh, with peers coming from all these countries and taking courses here in Brazil. So why Brazil? Because this is where I live, okay? This is where I practice. And at the Fall Center, we have this great facility that will hold up to 20 peers, uh, 20 delegates, if you will, and these four days will walk the participant through the fundamental concepts of understanding the artistry of composites, how to select the composites, how to do the shade selection, case selection, case indication, layering, direct layering, direct, indirect layering, which is part of my book, which I published with Andre Ritter, uh, and it's published by Quintessence. And uh, there will be lecture there will be lots of hands-on you do class four restorations peg laterals you will learn how to work on a single tooth say a patient comes in with a discolored central and you have uh, um, calcific metamorphosis and you can't do endo treatment you can't bleach and you need to do something conservative so you can do a veneer on that tooth so you'll learn how to use opaques how to do your layering and and a lot of anatomy kirk is you won't believe how much people learn about anatomy when they come to my courses and i'm not trying to sell a course here but i'm just really telling you i have developed a technique for teaching from a to z concepts of primary anatomy secondary anatomy tertiary finishing polishing to look like the real thing it's amazing i mean it's it's a no-brainer and it's all packed into this package that you everybody will walk away with their knowledge laid out from a to z under my supervision and my teaching assistance this is in four days and it's from 8 a.m to 6 p.m and it's going to be a great experience with a grand finale with a, a dinner here at the falls. <laughs> I love it. I love it. If you're on the fence, don't be on the fence. Go. And Newton, you've been so gracious that anybody listen to this podcast, if you mention the podcast, uh, I'll put the details in the show notes. Uh, Newton will give you $150 um, you know, discount in order to be able to go to the course. It's just an opportunity to see this firsthand. And it's one of many great things. That is not the only thing you do. You have an amazing uh, educational institute. And I would say if you haven't seen Newton speak, whether it be at the Fall Center or anywhere, you got to see him speak. He's You're just an incredible educator. So if you're not taking notes while you're listening to this podcast, just flip up to the notes in Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, everything that Newton and I mentioned, including the links to the course, the new links to the Fall Center. I actually am going to put a link to your book too. I got to get your book. Um, yeah. It'll all be down there. You can just flip up to the notes, click on it. It'll take you right there. Um, gosh, dude, I'm so grateful. I finally got you on, buddy. I appreciate hey. this. Hey, Kirk, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's always a pleasure talking to you. We could, I could talk to you all night long, <laughs> all night long. You're, you're, you're the perfect host. Thank you, my friend. Well, I'm so grateful. I am, uh, I'm grateful for this profession. I'm grateful that all of you guys kind of took me under your wings. I love the education piece and I just want to leave this profession in better condition than we found it. And I know we have so many great young listeners that are just eager to learn. I'm telling you, Dr. Newton Falls, the real deal. Uh, check it out. And so, Newton, I'm going to be back again and again and again as much as we can get you 
to talk about anything. We should just talk about food one day. That would be kind of fun. We'll, we'll do. <laughs> let's get Bob. Let's get Bob in. We'll talk about wine and food. <laughs> yeah. Bob's not working. He, he's working like three days a month. And I'm going to make him listen to this. But like, hey, when you get good, you can choose how much you want to work. And that's another great thing, too. So That's true. That's awesome. Well, Newton, stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the podcast and the best practices show and particularly this episode again i'm so grateful um keep showing up we're going to keep bringing it like i said if you enjoyed today uh do us a favor hit the share button share this with your friends flip up to the notes check out newton's offerings i promise you you won't be disappointed and until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show podcast you guys enjoy your day (music) 